इंटरव्यू की तैयारी अच्छा करना करना चाहते हैं तो आप संकल्प के सारे प्रोग्राम को अटेंड कीजिए केवल मॉक इंटरव्यू ही इंटरव्यू की प्रिपरेशन नहीं है पर्सनालिटी टेस्ट की तो आप सब लोग संकल्प के सारे प्रोग्राम को अटेंड करें जो लोग नए जुड़े होंगे मैं बता देता हूँ संकल्प में लेक्चर होता है मॉक इंटरव्यू मॉक इन ग्रुप हमारा सबसे पॉपुलर प्रोग्राम है वन टू वन डैब डिस्कशन और वन टू वन हॉबी डिस्कशन ये पांच चीजें होती हैं तो हमारे साथ जुड़ गए हैं श्रीमान अशोक सिंह सर वैसे तो अशोक सिंह सर बहुत ही स्पेशल व्यक्ति हैं उनकी एक अलग स्टोरी है लेकिन वो अभी मैं नहीं बताता हूँ सिर्फ आपको मैं इतना ही बताना चाहूंगा कि बहुत लंबे समय से ये सिविल सर्विस के एक्सपीरियंट्स को स्टूडेंट्स को गाइड कर रहे हैं बहुत ही लंबे समय से आप संकल्प से जुड़े हुए हैं और आपका जो स्पेशलिटी है वो इकोनॉमिक्स और इंटरनेशनल रिलेशंस है तो आज का जो हमारा सेशन है वो बजट एंड इकोनॉमिक सर्वे का है मैं सभी फ्रेंड से रिक्वेस्ट करता हूं कि दोस्तों आपके जितने भी डाउट हों इस सेशन से आप क्लियर करके जाइएगा अपने जितने भी क्वेश्चन है आप जरूर पूछे इस सेशन को आप इंजॉय करें अब मैं माननीय श्री अशोक सिंह सर से रिक्वेस्ट करता हूं कि कृपया अपना सेशन प्रारंभ करें थैंक यू राजू जी आप आवाज क्लियर है राजू जी 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 सर साउंड थोड़ा मैंने दिया है माइक को इसलिए मैं पूछ रहा था ठीक है ठीक है स्टार्ट और जब नहीं होगा तो बीच में स्टूडेंट बता देंगे सर आप बता देंगे थैंक यू Uh, as you know, today's session is on the budget, and uh, what we might call uh, the limited economic survey for this year. Limited in the sense that it's not actually called an economic survey. Uh, I hope all of you are in English uh, medium, so you don't have any problems with the language. I'm not supposed to speak in Hindi. I think. Well, I'm ready to hear that, na? ये सेशन जनरली तो इंग्लिश में ही रहता है अगर कोई स्टूडेंट कुछ कहना चाहे तो आप बता दें हिंदी में पूछना चाहे तो कोई समस्या नहीं है ठीक है ठीक है राइट ऑल राइट राइट नाउ इन सम वेज द बजट फॉर दिस ईयर इज यू नो इट्स नॉट पर्टिकुलरली इंपॉर्टेंट आई आई थिंक यू कैन इजली गेस व्हाई इट्स नॉट इंपॉर्टेंट बिकॉज इट्स वेल एज यू नो इट्स इट्स रियली अ वोट ऑन अकाउंट Interim budget. We'll talk a bit about this because you could be asked some questions on these. I'm sure you must have studied many of these things in uh, your written exam part. But nevertheless, I think a brief comment uh, would be useful. So let me start with some slides, right? And we'll share the screen on these slides. So we have. Uh, Give me a minute to just open the PPT. I think it's just come onto this uh, system.
seems to be some hang up in this uh, dual computer system. That's why I have problems in sharing the screen. But I think now this should be visible to you. Uh, yes, sir. Right? The slides are uh, visible. Yes, sir. It is visible. Right. So let's continue now. Now, see, you know what, what makes the budget this year different from the normal years, say last year, 23? It is the fact that we are going to have elections uh, in the near future. The announcement of the Lok Sabha election should be made sometime in February. And the elections are expected between April and May. Then you'll have a new government in place by June, right? Now, the financial year begins in April, and you're going to have a new government after two months of the present financial year. That's April and May. Therefore, it's a constitutional convention I should call it a constitutional convention, that uh, in an election year, the outgoing government does not present a full budget. A full budget would be something covering the entire coming financial year. So what is presented is called an interim budget. And there are two terms that you'll come across. In fact, there are other terms also. But generally, the constitutional term is vote on account. The popular term is interim budget. Both of these have some significance. So what you have this year is uh, an interim budget and a vote on account to be passed by the Lok Sabha. Obviously, you know, the financial uh, aspects of government are primarily controlled by the Lok Sabha. Rajya Sabha has very minor role in this. Now, the vote on account, remember, is under Article 116 of the Constitution, right? And essentially, the idea of what an account is a grant from the uh, from parliament for meeting the immediate needs or the short term needs of the government. Now, one interesting thing that you should remember is that till a few years ago, a vote on account used to be passed every year. Now, the vote on account is required occasionally, and in general, only in election years. I hope you are aware of the, of the reason for this significant change. Right? Are you aware? Why? Why have no, uh, no, sir, I am not aware. Can you tell, please? Oh, I thought these are the types of things that you should have studied normally. You see, do you remember at least do you remember till a few years ago when the budget used to be presented? The budget used to be presented at the end of February, 28th of February normally. If it was a leap year, it might be 29th. And the process of passing the budget would go on till end April or May. So the problem was the financial year would begin before the budget would be passed. The financial year would begin on the 1st of April. The budget would be passed by the end of April or the beginning of May. Now, that necessitated passing a vote on account every year. So every year, Parliament used to pass a vote on account in March for two months. That's for the months of April and May. Before the full budget would be adopted. Now, that is not a problem because now we present the budget at the beginning of February and uh, government tries to ensure that it's passed by the end of March. Now, once it's passed by the end of March, it's passed before the financial year begins. So you would have uh, the full budget in place. This vote on account thing becomes important only in election years. So 2024 being an election year, not leap year. Leap year, of course, it's a leap year, but leap year is not the key factor here. The key factor is the fact that we're going to have 
Lok Sabha and general elections this year. So we need this. We need to pass this vote on account through an interim budget for at least three months. Why at least three months? April, May and June. The election would be completed in May, but formation of a government sometimes takes uh, some time. I don't know how much time it will take this year. That would depend on the results of the elections. Uh, if it goes on expected lines, then you probably will have a government in place by the end of May. But if there are some unex unexpected results, you, it might get delayed, the formation of a coalition, etc. So it will be passed for at least three months. That is till the end of June. Yeah, so this is the basic idea. Now, a interim budget and vote on account. If somebody asks you about this, these terms are interchangeably used. But there is some difference between them. Interim budget contains both the revenue and the expenditure details for the period until the new government is expected to take over and present the budget. The voter account, on the other hand, is focused on the government's expenditure. The withdrawal of money from the Consolidated Fund of India to meet the expected expenditure of the union government for the first three years of the coming financial year. So what an account is, well, you could say this is the constitutional requirement. Parliament has to approve this. Because expenditure from the consolidated fund requires parliamentary authority, authority of parliament. So that's the vote on account part. And the interim budget, on the other hand, contains all these details. That difference set aside, let's move on. What are the limitations as far as the interim budget is concerned? Why is it in some ways less important? Well, primarily because it's going to cover only one fourth of the financial year, three months. April, May, June. Further, there is always a possibility that a new government might come in. Well, in any case, a new government will come in. Even if the BJP leaves the government, it will be called a new government. But what we mean is slightly different. What we mean is, let's imagine that the political complexion of the government itself changes. For example, in 2014, before the elections, we had a UPA government. Post-election, we had an NDA government. Now, NDA government would have its own approach in terms of fiscal priorities, how to raise money, how to spend money, and so on. Now, suppose this year, you have uh, a non-BJP alliance forming a government at May end. Now, they would certainly like to make some changes. And some of those changes might be major changes. So the budget, the interim budget, is limited in its coverage, both in terms of time, as well as the areas that it covers, the types of changes that it seeks to bring about. A lot of these could be changed by the new government. So in this sense, it has a very limited importance. But on the other hand, I would also say it can have considerable significance. Now, why would it have considerable significance? This year, particularly, the general expectation, I don't know whether general expectation will necessarily work out, well, the general expectation is that the elections of uh, 2024 are likely to bring back the same party and the same alliance in power. I think you will agree whether you are a, a supporter or a critic of the present government. I think this is the general expectation. Obviously, if you are Rahul Gandhi, then you would not have this type of expectation. Then you would be convinced that we are going to vote out this government. But I'm talking about uh, analysts and those you know, who study these things and uh, or even say apologists, etc. Now, in that case, suppose we have continuity. So I'm making this point here. Then the interim budget highlights the government's thought process. 
what way is the government thinking or top leadership of the government is thinking? It lays out a path for the future. What direction is the country expected to move in subsequently? And if the same government returns to power, then you would normally expect a high degree of continuity in policies also. Of course, it's possible that you know the particular minister might change. Nirmala Sitaraman has been finance minister now for quite some time. I think this was her sixth budget. It is, uh, I don't know what will happen. Suppose there's a BJP led government, well, it will be the prime minister and other top leaders who will decide the, uh, the structure of that government. So it's possible that the finance minister might change or conceivable. I don't know. I'm not saying probable. I'm not using the word probable. I'm saying possible or conceivable. Yet the policies are not very greatly dependent on the particular minister. So we would still expect a continuity in policy matters. And 19 example is cited by analysts. If you look at the 2019 example, the interim budget that was prepared and uh, presented in February, and then the final budget that was presented in July that year, little changed. The overall approach remained essentially the same. So you could say that this is likely in 2024 also, assuming that the election results are on expected lines. So in that sense, this is given considerable significance. Now, who gives this considerable significance? Think a bit about that also. It's not civil service candidates who will you know, determine the significance of the budget or people like me commenting on it. But what I mean is, say, investors, foreign investors, domestic investors, uh, financial sector, the people in different financial sectors, stock markets, and so on, they would be concerned about these issues. And for them, obviously, the interim budget would then have significance in terms of the continuity that is expected in terms of policies and outlays, etc. So this is the significance of the interim budget, despite these limitations that we have pointed out. Now, one interesting thing that you would have noticed is that the budget speech was relatively uh, shorter. Usually, Nirmala Sitaraman's budget speeches used to be of the order of two hours or so. I think this year it was under an hour. Now, obviously, that is largely because it was a interim budget. There are very limited number of things to be discussed in the budget speech. But what was discussed was still significant. And when the regular budget is presented, June end or July, depending on how the government formation goes, you would have a much longer budget speech. Now, some of the things that are significant, I just point out some of the things, right? Not going to every detail for interview purpose. What is this term that was used, GDP redefined? as governance, development, and performance. And the finance minister claimed or said, I should not say claims, he said, that performance and governance have been the differentiators of this present government, focused on development. I think, don't go by that uh, traditional idea of GDP in terms of the gross domestic product. Well, that is still valid, that is still valid, but reinterpret it also, redefine it as governance, development, and performance. So focusing on development, focusing on good governance, and performing, not just financial outlays. What he was trying to say is that C and the government of which C is a part, 
do not just want to bring about financial outlays, but results from those financial outlays. That's the performance part. Now, that's of course for the public to judge, but he is pointing out some of the things that were mentioned. Now, the seven trillion dollar economy was also mentioned. A 2030 goal, a roadmap. She said that the government is laying down a roadmap for this. And India is well positioned to achieve this. We come to this slightly later. Why it's well, why it was claimed that it's well positioned. Partly because we've had consistent, uh, you know, around 7% or more growth for the last three years, the post-COVID period. The fastest growing big economy in the world. And this is particularly being contrasted with China. My advice would be, <laughs> look at a bit, look at at least a bit of the Chinese economy. I'm not going to discuss the Chinese economy. But Chinese economy is in all sorts of trouble currently. They're facing a serious crisis. The last 20 or 30 odd years, India has been contrasted unfavorably with China. China very rapidly growing, a Chinese tiger, an Indian elephant. Now it seems the roles are reversing. The tiger is now becoming a, well, maybe it's an aging tiger, not able to move fast. And India is now growing much faster. International investment is being redirected towards India. And this is both in terms of FDI as well as portfolio investments. China is still a much bigger economy. There is no doubt about that part. It's a much bigger economy. Uh, it has far more manufacturing uh, capacity than India. But in terms of growth, in terms of prospects, the scenario has reversed or is reversing. I should not say it's completely reversed. China is trying to recover. A lot of the, you know, the initiatives that China had taken in the last decade are now floundering including the international initiatives. Yet, the economy is obviously far bigger than India. Even if India grew much faster than China, it would take us several decades to catch up with China. Several decades. It's not going to be, not going to be something that will happen in the next 10 or 20 odd years. Yet, the fact that India is doing much better than China currently is undisputed. And global investors are particularly focusing on that. This uh, in contrasting experience of India and China. So that's why I'm saying India is now well positioned. Of course, some people think that 7% growth is not enough. What India should aim at is something like 9 or 10% as China had achieved for a long time. Now maybe we might be capable of doing that. But again, that's not something that's going to happen in the near future. It would take quite some time. But 7% is also very good, consistent 7% performance. Now, let's move to some of the other points now in this context. Particularly focusing on deficit aspects. I think this, in some ways, from the global perspective, the business perspective, a financial sector perspective. This is the most important part of the budget of this year. Government has checked its revenue expenditure. Now, why it's very important, I'll explain that also in a moment. Government has checked its revenue expenditure. In fact, the revenue expenditure, excluding interest payments, interest payments, of course, are a different thing because we keep on borrowing more and more. And as you borrow more and more, see, as long as you have a fiscal deficit, you will borrow. And as long as you borrow, the interest cost will rise unless the interest rate comes down. At the moment, interest rates are relatively high. Why they are relatively high? Because we've had very high rates of inflation in the last few years. 
to check that RBI has increased the interest rate significantly. International interest, rate, interest rates have also gone up. US has recorded interest rates at this time. So that interest burden of the government is rising. It will start falling later when the interest rates in the economy start coming down. But excluding this, they have checked the revenue expenditure, which is considered a big achievement. The revenue expenditure is essentially things like say social sector, administrative, and so on. Now it is necessary. Nobody says that revenue expenditure is useless. But runaway growth of revenue expenditure is very dangerous for the economy. And they have been faced with this type of problem in the past. So this is a big achievement that we are finally able to check revenue expenditure. There are a lot of popular social schemes that the government is running. Manrega, Dal Jeevan, etc. The outlays are essentially unchanged. Now, there are two ways of looking at this. One is if you are concerned with broader economic uh, prospects, long-term performance of the economy and so on, people will welcome this. But on the other hand, there's a lot of criticism also. There are some people who have been saying that the government had leeway for increasing expenditure on uh, social sector schemes on agriculture, for example, or agriculture also. And this leeway has not been used. The government has not increased the outlays on these schemes. So this can cut both ways. On one, on one side, this is a sense of fiscal responsibility, trying to check deficit. On the other side, people will look at this as a failure of the government. And if you want to oversimplify it, oversimplify it, then it can be claimed that this government is concerned more with you know, the abstract fiscal parameters, which are important for the global investors and big Indian businessmen, rather than for the poor. But the difficulty is, and I hope you have some idea of this difficulty, that if you run up very high deficits, if you focus on printing currency notes in order to finance government programs and handouts, ultimately the economy will be ruined. And there are many countries, our neighbor Pakistan, for example, that in this type of a trap. So some sense of fiscal responsibility has to be there. That's the situation as far as this, uh, you know, this deficit. But let me comment a bit more on the fiscal deficit part. See, most analysts, economists, and so on, business analysts, they had expected that the fiscal deficit this year, that means FY24, FY24, by the way, is 2023-24. And the coming year is called FY25. That's 2024 to 2025. Remember this FY term. Most analysts had expected the fiscal deficit for FY24 would be higher than the target. And for FY25 also, the government would not be able to check the fiscal deficit very significantly. Now, why? Because elections are coming up. And the general trend center, as well as the states, has been that before elections, you try to spend more money on populist uh, schemes in order to influence the voters just before the election, announce some schemes. And of course, provide some money. If you don't provide any money, just announce these schemes. The people will also see through it. Now, 19, look at the 19 example. The government had introduced this Pradhan Mantri Kisan Samman Nidhi Yojana 
in the 19 interim budget. This was quite a big outlay. And it did have some sig political significance at that time. I suppose it still has significance. Voters are still impressed by this, at least a section of the voters. But in 19, it was, uh, it was fairly effective. So a lot of people had expected that something like this might be done this year also. And that has not happened. That is the remarkable part of it. And if it's not happened, it sends several types of messages. The most important message is probably that this government is so confident of its uh, victory in the coming elections that it does not feel the need to uh, compete with these types of populist steps at this stage. And they've already done enough. Of course, some people would even argue that the Ram Mandir has been more important than these types of measures. Again, opponents, opponents of the ruling party and the government to come out with these types of arguments. But I hope you have understood this point. That in an election year, it's generally expected that populist measures will be taken. Some new type of schemes which might attract people. persuade them to vote for the ruling party would be undertaken. State governments also do this. Almost every state you will find these types of steps being taken. They've avoided this. And that is the secret to checking the fiscal deficit. So the expectation had been that we would have a target of 5.3%. What we have is actually 5.1% for FI25. The finance minister also claimed that FY26 target will be lower than the 4.5%. Now, when finance ministers make statements like this, analysts often uh, you know, are very naturally suspicious. Suspicious in the sense that talk is very easy. Can they actually do it? Very unlikely. This is the usual reaction. The difference this year is last three days and you know, after the budget was presented if you look at the reaction from uh, well i'm not talking about political reaction remember i'm talking about business analyst reaction and neutral economists not economists who are affiliated to particular parties in general they feel that the finance minister has earned a considerable credibility so if he's making a statement of this type it has to be taken seriously it is more likely than not that the government will manage to meet this lower than 4.5% target for FY26. Now, of course, there are um, other reasons also, apart from the credibility. So this is a fiscally prudent budget. Trying to restrict the fiscal deficit, but at the same time, focusing on a lot of important things. We'll turn to that now. What are the main factors that have made it easier to check this deficit? Tax collections have been booming, both direct and indirect taxes. Now that, of course, is connected with the economy doing well. So direct and indirect tax collections have gone up significantly. Other sources of income for the government have also gone up. For example, dividends. Substantial dividends have come to the government from the Reserve Bank of India. Central public sector enterprises have provided a lot of resources, CPSCs. And the, all of these have helped to reach that fiscal deficit target of 5.8% for FY24. So these are some of the factors that you should keep in mind. Apart from 
Il y a notre growth. Now, one of the most important things in the general economy and also in the budget context is the role of PSUs. And I think this is also something that uh, uh, should be the subject matter of questions, and at least for some people in the interviews. This PSU performance turnaround, you could call it turnaround also, has been also fairly remarkable. If you were studying Indian economy, say six or seven, seven, eight years ago, even after Mr. Modi became prime minister, at least three, four years of Mr. Modi's prime ministership, the pre-COVID period also, the general idea was that PSUs are an albatross. A little scope for revival. Most PSUs, the best idea would be to get rid of them somehow. Very poor performance. Little scope for turnaround and so on. And somehow there has been a turnaround. That itself is the subject matter of you know, a lot of studies. And the turnaround again. What, what I was trying to say was this, that one way of looking at turnaround of PSUs would be the government saying that PSUs are performing well. Well, all governments claim this, make these types of clips. The financial turnaround, many PSUs, including PSU banks, by the way, has been reflected in something you know, which is much more difficult to fake. That is the stock market capitalization of public sector units. Many public sector units have been the most outstanding performers in the stock markets in the last few years. And foreign investors who are generally very, very suspicious about public sector performance, well, they have been flocking in with big investments in all these public sector banks and uh, public sector railway companies, defense companies, and so on. So this has been made possible partly because of uh, economic growth, overall economic growth. I think policy changes with regard to the PSUs, giving them greater uh, uh, autonomy, lesser political interference, bureaucratic interference, lesser, it's not gone away, but it's less. And uh, uh, a lot of the steps that have been taken, for example, for cleaning up bank balance sheets, etc., are now being reflected in PSUs. Now, what is the importance of this? Now, look at this. The market capitalization of the major public sector enterprises has quadrupled in the last four years. Um, think of how remarkable this is, that shares of banks like, say, Punjab National Bank, Bank of Baroda, and so on, which were one cons once considered to be parias, that means useless, are now performing much better than ICICA Bank, HDFC Bank, Axis Bank far better performance. Of course, one reason would be that they start out with a much lower base. But their share prices have been going up multiple times in the last one, one and a half, two years. HDFC, on the other hand, has been going down, which was considered the most outstanding bank in India. 
Now, what is the importance of this? Well, one importance is, of course, for the economy as a whole. The fact that these public sector enterprises are doing so well. But also of this, now look at this point. This is going to be a key point in the future. That reaching a fiscal deficit target of below 4.5% is now feasible if the government goes in for some strategic selling of PSCs. They can get a much higher price than they would have commanded a few years ago. In fact, the government has now become much more choosy about divestment. They are saying we are not going to divest merely because of uh, budgetary constraints. We will divest based on a strategic plan. So this fiscal leeway is improving. And if this performance can be sustained over the next four or five years, I think the fiscal situation in the country will change dramatically. It's already changing significantly. It will change very dramatically in the next four or five years. So all this has been talked about in the context of the budget 2024. Right? Now, impact of this fiscal deficit control check, it will help India. Any Anybody has any question at this stage? Yeah, go ahead. I could hear some voice, so maybe, or maybe I should look at the chat. Uh, so, sir, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Uh, sir, so you talked about the fiscal deficit target. It was five point one percent, but the actual it has been five point eight percent. Like how there are so many figures. No, uh, no, no, so... no. You see, last year's target was five point eight only. It was not five point one. Okay. So 5.1 is for the coming year. All these targets had gone haywire because of the COVID crisis. Okay. The COVID crisis, those three years of COVID, obviously affected the economy very badly. I will show you. Uh, uh, can you I'll just move forward a bit? Look at this slide. Okay. Uh, this slide is not fiscal deficit slide. Is the capex slide? Capex means capital expenditure. Okay. Capital expenditure. Capital expenditure is related to fiscal deficit. Now, after this, India had relatively high capital expenditure in the budget, beginning of the 1990s, but a major fiscal crisis, so it could not be sustained. Then it went down significantly. Kept, just kept on going down, down, down. Started improving at some stage, again went down. I think some disturbance. Sir, uh, it's not from my end. I think someone. No, not from you, somebody else. So yes, if you can just uh, wherever this is coming from, you can just mute yourself for a few minutes. You can unmute if you want to ask something directly. But I find this to be an interesting graph. In terms of uh, understanding, you know some aspects. The capital expenditure is a key part of the budget. Now look at the recent trend. This is, by the way, politically bifurcated. Blue is the Congress-led uh, governments, and the other color, the orange, is BJP-led governments. So it's not as if the Congress-led governments' performance has been very bad. Look at this, look at the relatively high capital expenditure in the period of uh, uh, Manmohan Singh, for example, as the finance minister. And then look at this, Manmohan Singh as prime minister, much lower capital expenditure. Mr. Modi became prime minister again, initially it is low, then it comes the dips a bit, dips a bit, dips because, for example, GST put some pressure on the fiscal situation giving compensation to the states, etc. Then last three years, it starts climbing up consistently. This is considered the important part of it. These are the last three years, including the current year. Okay. Consistently climbing up. So fiscal deficit is being checked. Capital expenditure is rising. And the correlation of these two things is what is important. Okay. And sir, so this 5.3%, which I mean, there are so many uh, these numbers, I'm I'm confused. 
which one is for what like what is the fiscal deficit this year finally if we want to is it 5.1% 5.3% what it is or is it 5.8% fy25 would be 5.1% fy25 fy25 okay and this year sir this year is 0 0.8 point sorry eight. sir 5.8% right Okay. And then and FY, FY20, uh, sorry, FY26, sorry. they are expecting 4.5 or below. FY26. Okay, okay so it will be 5.8, 5.1, and 4.5. And okay. those at the same time, look at this rise in capital expenditure. Yes, sir. So cutting down the fiscal deficit and yet increasing the capital expenditure. That is considered the big achievement. So is it due to the majorly due to decline in revenue? The, uh, increase deficit? in revenue, increase in revenue, increase in uh, uh, public sector undertaking contribution. No, no, sir. Revenue deficit is de decreasing, right? Uh, revenue deficit is decreasing exactly. So that that obviously is contributing. Is contributing. You're putting more okay. money into capital expenditure. In fact, that's the other point to understand. Just look at this for a couple of minutes, okay. then you will understand Sorry. this more. Thank you, sir. How does how does this reducing fiscal deficit help? This makes it easier for Indian securities to raise foreign exchange. And in particular, this is an important thing that's going to happen this year. India is getting listed in what is called the JP Morgan Government Index Emerging Markets Fund. This is a very important uh, international indicator. Why is it an important international indicator? Because the global investors, global investors, the big, uh, uh, let's say the big mutual funds, pension funds, etc. in America, other Western countries, they put in a lot of money into those countries' bonds which are part of this J.P. Morgan's government index. India, for the first time, is being included in this from June 2024. And a key reason for this is India's fiscal deficit is now under control. Government borrowings are under control. So that's why Morgan these JP Morgan people are including India in the, into this index. Now, this would be useful for India in terms of foreign uh, capital inflows. But keep in mind that this can be dangerous also because it might lead to a lot of hot money coming into India. So you'll find that the finance secretary yesterday was saying that we will not have an open house type of thing as far as this foreign capital flows are concerned. Because please understand this point, that this is this is foreign debt flows, not foreign equity. Debt. Debt means in the form of bonds. Again, sorry, we again have some disturbance in the background. Please. Anybody... Jayant Garg. Uh, you want to ask some question? No, sir. He was unmute, so sound okay, was. Oh, he was unmuted. I see. You, you noticed it. Right, right, right. All right. So, I hope it's clear that this this is going to lead to debt flows, and debt flows can be dangerous also. You know, they can trigger volatility in the uh, markets, the bond markets, etc. So while it it can be good for India in terms of uh, access to foreign funds, but it could lead to some volatility and dangers. So Indian government will be very careful with this also. This, of course, was not stated in the budget, but as a finance secretary in the post-budget discussions. So this is something significant in terms of this. Now, the other point that we're making was this, the government focusing on capital expenditure. This is again long term growth, long term performance of the Indian economy. This is the key. 
And it's particularly important because private capital uh, expenditure has been lagging. The government can kickstart private capital expenditure also. That's the idea here. That government leads the way here in terms of uh, infrastructure investments. And uh, that provides impetus to the private sector, Indian investors, foreign investors, to come in with different projects and start investing more. Now, the government expects something like a 16% jump in capex, primarily on infrastructure projects in the coming financial year. So this would be in areas like transport, for example, ports, airports, railways are particularly important. The Gati Sakti initiatives, variety of corridors, have been mentioned in the budget also. So all that would uh, you know, multiply the capacity of the economy and hopefully get the investment cycle going. Investment cycle means more and more private investments coming in to supplement the government investments. We are talking about public-private partnership here. So this is not PPP. The idea here is government investments will create the atmosphere, the environment in which private capex expenditure can also start increasing much more rapidly. You now they would have more confidence in the economy, and this is especially important in the so-called China plus one strategy. Those who are trying to diversify away from China can be attracted to India. China, one of the biggest advantages for China was infrastructure. The other was, of course, trained human resources. So at least on this part, India is now doing well. And this is the focus of the current budget also. Current budget has focused on this aspect particularly. Now, with this, right now, let's move on. I think we have uh, if fiscal deficit comes down. The government has said that this will mean that interest rates are likely to start coming down now. Now, of course, interest rates will be part of RBI's remit. That's the RBI will be controlling the interest rate part, the Monetary Policy Committee. But one of the important factors in their decision is the fiscal deficit. Less borrowing by the government. And the government expects to decrease its borrowing by about 8.5% in the coming financial year. Corporate cost of borrowing should go down. This should promote private sector investment and policy rate cuts by the RBI. These are some of the other things that are likely to change in the coming year. I mean, this is the hope that we have, right? Now, capital expenditure, why is capital expenditure so important? We ask you, why, why do we focus so much on capital expenditure? Well, physical infrastructure will generate employment opportunities on its own. Employment is a big problem, even today. There's a lot of criticism of economic policies that they are not generating adequate employment. But infrastructure can create employment opportunities. Of course, a lot of this would be semi-skilled. But then many people coming from rural areas in our country are semi-skilled. They are not highly skilled. It will reduce the cost of doing business for corporates foreign investors, Indian investors. It will help reduce regional disparities. A lot of this infrastructure, for example, is coming into states like UP. Look at major transportation projects in Uttar Pradesh, the biggest state in India in population terms, and one of the most backward. In future years, you could expect much higher growth in UP. 
the UP itself is aiming to become a trillion dollar economy. Maybe they will achieve it. Uh, Bihar, of course, is lagging behind. That's my statement. I want to focus on Bihar. Uh, UP is certainly doing much better at the moment. It will create demand for various products. This, by the way, is again what China had done. China became the largest manufacturer of products like cement, steel, etc. Partly because of its infrastructure push. Now, India is going in for a similar push. So we should have much greater demand for these cement, steel, etc. And that itself will also generate employment. And then, of course, the investments that will come in will also create employment. But all this will take time. It's not something that's going to happen in, say, 2024 end or something. It's going to take five to ten years. If if we can maintain this, then I think this would be. Okay, so this is the theme of the budget speech, by the way. If you look at the underlying theme, it was this. Now, some of the specifics that were talked about in the budget, I'll just mention a couple of them. Tourism. That India is, can become a major center for business and conference tourism and, of course, religious tourism. Religious tourism is often uh, underestimated. It's not just Ayodhya, a lot of other tourist centers in the country, but business and conference tourism also. So this is uh, been given a push in this budget. And of course, just before the budget, the government are also focused on this Suryoda Yojana. So that, again, there are outlays in the budget for this. This is also something quite important. The aim here is to provide rooftop solar scheme uh, facilities to the middle class and uh, uh, lower groups, income groups. This won't be very easy. It will be it will be difficult. But using subsidies come loans and with technical support from public and private sector, this could be done. It will provide free electricity, save a lot of money to middle class and to relatively poor people. And through net metering, they could contribute surplus electricity. And remember, this scheme would have importance for uh, India's fight against climate change. So there are multiple benefits that could come out of these types of schemes. They would be difficult to implement. Now, this would be highly decentralized. And there would be all sorts of bureaucratic obstacles, etc. The REC is going to be the main funding organization, the Rural Electrification Corporation. So these are some of the interesting initiatives for this budget. One criticism of the budget was for not providing any, in, any uh, tax benefits to the middle class in terms of, say, income tax slabs or some other types of benefits. Now, there the government has focused on fiscal stability and predictability, maintain the existing rates, including the external duties, etc. Don't tamper with them too much. And of course, the budget in June, July could change this for the coming financial year. There would be a possibility of changes at that stage, but no changes now. No changes at this stage. Some people were very disappointed by this. There should have been more uh, for the middle class. You know, redu reduction of income tax rates or giving them more incentives in some other ways. Of course, there is an economic argument also, by the way, that uh, 
if you reduce the income tax on the middle class, then uh, the money that they save from the taxes generally goes into consumption. So that could have also boosted uh, demand in the economy. I think this is something that will probably be considered in the main budget. Not at this stage. They have not done anything. Now, the budget is always a political document also. It's connected with the political economy. And this year's budget, as far as this year's budget is concerned, I think the political message seems to be, at least that is the way most analysts and experts are interpreting it, that it reflects the confidence of the government to maintain a fiscally prudent and responsible policy and yet return to power. That they don't need to be irresponsible and imprudent in order to be uh, capable of returning to power. That is the political economy message coming out of this budget. Now, a very brief comment on this. There was no economic survey this year. Reason being that this is not a full budget. So there will be an economic survey when the full budget is presented. At the same time, the government wanted to provide a review for the Indian economy. So this was presented, a review, it, it's not called economic survey, it's called the Indian economy, a review, January 2024. You can download it from the uh, DEA website, the Department of Economic Affairs website. I'll just summarize a few important points from this, right, which could be raised in interviews. Keep in mind, this is not just like it was not a full budget. This is not a economic survey. And that is why they have deliberately called it a review of the Indian economy, recent performance and prospects instead of calling it the regular economic survey, which I'm sure you must have studied uh, during your exam preparation. Now, what, what do they say in this? The Indian economy is likely to grow at over 7% in the coming years, over 7%. Likely to become the third largest economy in the world in the next three years. The third largest in dollar terms, not PPP terms. A GDP of over 5 trillion will be achieved coming years. But keep in mind the limitation of this. One should not be very happy over this. The per capita income of our country is still extremely low. Poverty has been falling. There's no doubt about that. Poverty has been falling in our country. But India is the poorest country among the G20 as well as the BRICS in per capita income terms. Third largest in terms of GDP does not really mean all that much. Ultimately, we have to increase the per capita income apart from reducing inequalities, etc., significantly, then, let me use a term which is very popular these days, that achieving Ram Raj would also require uh, boosting economic growth, boosting economic growth, improving per capita income a lot. Ram Mandir, is not the end of the story. I think it's the beginning. It should be the beginning. That's the way it should be looked at by the uh, by the leaders of our country. 
Since we have focused on this. Instead of setting down. What are the things that have been boosting growth in India? According to this uh, review, it's basically driven by domestic demand along with supply side measures such as investment in infrastructure and measures to boost in manufacturing, all those PLI schemes, etc. This is the story behind India's current growth and hopefully it's a sustainable growth because domestic demand is still growing, supply side measures are being taken consistently, infrastructure investment is being promoted and the government has taken up a lot of schemes to boost manufacturing. Right. Now, there are three themes that have been mentioned in this uh, report, which also could figure in your interview. So let me very briefly comment on these also. You will find that this report, this economic review rather, talks about three major issues in the coming uh, years. One is, of course, geopolitical conflicts. We still have Ukraine-Russia war going on. At the same time, West Asia now has a very serious crisis and which might expand. And you know that that's that's leading to some jumps of uh, oil and gas prices, although they are still largely under control. They're still around, uh, you know, crude, for example, around $80, Brent crude. It's it's not likely to touch three digits. But nevertheless, that's a risk. Plus, a risk to sea trade because of the fighting in that region. So this is going to be a matter of concern how long, nobody knows. However, the report is focused on three trends of a longer duration. The longer duration trends, the three things that they're talking about, one is in the context of uh, the end of hyper-globalization. This is the term that has been used, hyper-globalization. What did hyper-globalization really mean? Why have they used this, uh, this term? I'm sure you must have read about this, but let me just give you a brief. Instance. That later part of the 20th century, last couple of decades in the 20th century, and the first two decades of this 21st century, globalization moved very rapidly. All spheres but particularly, of course, economic links, supply chains, global supply chains. The last few years, 2020 onwards, particularly 2020 onwards, several factors have come together to block this uh, growing hyper-globalization trend. COVID, disruption caused by COVID, supply chains were completely disrupted. And of course, the risk of similar uh, you know, outbreaks in the future, a lot of people are concerned with this, that this is not the last such uh, health crisis that the world will face. They could come up again in the coming decades but also the political factors have disrupted uh, hyper-globalization. A tension between Russia and Western countries, and even more importantly, China and US, as well as several European countries. I think that has become a key to 
slowing down the pace of globalization. And many people think that this is the end of hyper-globalization. End of hyper-globalization. That, that's more or less what this report also says. The era of hyper-globalization is now coming to an end. Now, this is going to have impact on many countries, including India, because the growth outlook is not just a function of our performance, but also of how the global developments affect us. This I'm quoting from the report, by the way, the spillover effects of the global developments. So increasing geoeconomic fragmentation. This is effort to reconstruct the supply chains. Reduce dependence on China, for example, because of the political risks. And this is not a problem for only for our country. The United States is even more concerned. Their dependence on China is even greater than our dependence on China. So this is what is leading to these trends like friend shoring and onshoring. What was just offshoring is now being replaced by friend shoring and onshoring. Onshoring obviously means bringing back some of the manufacturing, etc., to your own country. And friend shoring means, let's say, America reducing its dependence on China uh, and trying to replace it by countries which are more friendly towards America, Vietnam, India, and so on. That's friend shoring. China is the biggest target of this because China has been the key to hyper-globalization in the last three decades, especially after it joined WTO. This is part of the reason why the Chinese economy is slowing down, by the way. And Chinese economy is slowing down. China facing an economic crisis as far as we are concerned, is a double-edged weapon, mostly double-edged weapon. On one side, it will reduce China's strength and be helpful to us from a geopolitical viewpoint. But on the other hand, the global economic disruption will, ad will adversely affect us also. For example, Chinese slowdown means that China is dumping a lot of commodities in the world market, adversely affecting Indian producers, Indian chemical producers, for example. India is an important producer of various chemicals, specialty chemicals, etc. Many of them are facing problems currently because of China dumping these chemicals into the global market. So you will have problems of this type. Steel manufacturers facing similar problems. But this is going to be very important, according to the report. So we should focus on this hyper-globalization, end, end to hyper-globalization. Of course, this is connected with the fact that India is trying to become part of global supply chains, the new supply chains that are coming up. Then energy transition issues is the other, another important theme that has been mentioned here. The energy transition issues are connected with the uh, energy security and economic growth versus energy transition. So we want energy security. We want to have adequate energy resources for our essential needs. We want to ensure that economic growth does not falter because of energy uh, supply issues. But at the same time, we want to bring about energy transition by decarbonizing. That's why we the entire focus on solar energy, wind energy, hydrogen, and so on. Now, this is going to be a very complex issue in the future. Western countries put a lot of pressure on countries like India on, on this issue. But India has to con India has to also consider poverty. Uh, the fact that there are many people who are still very energy poor in our country, access to very little energy. 
and this will have all sorts of dimensions, geopolitical, technological, fiscal, economic, and social, for that matter. And the policies being adopted by each country will affect other countries also. There will be a lot of uh, interactions over this. So this is the other thing that they're focused on. The last one is a technology issue in this report. The AI challenge. That AI is also going to be a challenge for all countries, including our country, over the next couple of decades. It can significantly impact employment, especially in our competitive advantage area of services. India had had cost competitiveness as far as uh, services are concerned. But AI can erode that cost competitiveness in digital services. This is the digital services sector. And this report has referred to an IMF paper that 40% of global employment is exposed to AI. With the benefits of complementarity operating besides the risk of displacement. Both these factors are operating together. And developing economies must invest in infrastructure, digitally skilled labor force, etc. Now, this, by the way, is something that India has been doing as a private sector, which had taken the initiative for uh, uh, IT growth in India. So we do have a significant digitally skilled labor force. It's been growing, and I think. That's one of the advantages that India will have in the future also. And of course, the various policies that the government is taking up will also be significant in this regard. These are the things that are being talked about in this uh, report. Now, let's open up for some any questions now at the final stage. Last questions now, please. Sir? Uh, you have talked about the growth rate of India in GDP is uh, percentage being hovering around six to seven percent, sir. For the yes. extra demand, we need to have uh, exports. Uh, so for that, uh, sir, can you cite some significant steps being taken up in order to uh, have more exports so that our GDP growth uh, grows at the rate of eight percent, nine percent, sir? Uh, see, as we have been discussing. India's growth has been largely domestic focused, unlike China. So once China faces problems in market access in different parts of the world, their growth slows down a lot. That's much less uh, of a factor in our country. The advantage is that we are less affected by the global, uh, global market scenario. Disadvantage is that we don't get the benefit of those scale economies. But then India has a big scale on its own. So true, we need to expand exports. There's no doubt about that. And we need to diversify the exports from services to more and more to manufacturing and goods. Now, these PLI schemes, the PLI schemes that India has been launching and other related schemes and uh, manufacturing in India, the focus is not just on manufacturing for India, but manufacturing for the world. Infrastructure quality is in many ways the key here. Because if the logistics cost comes down, then India becomes much more attractive for that foreign investment and becoming part of uh, you know, these supply chains that were centered on China. So the advantage will not come through just focusing on exporting particular goods but ensuring that India becomes part of the global restructured global supply chains. India has entered into a variety of agreements with say US, Japan, European Union. Some of the free trade agreements that India is currently discussing will also be significant. We need to move those also forward. So 
India should be part of the reconstructed global supply chains. That would be much more important than just thinking of exporting particular commodities. Our past approach was focused on particular commodities. Right? So now we have to focus on these infrastructure, transportation, logistics, etc. that will help us to become part of that global supply chain. Of course, policy stability is also important. When I talk to a lot of the officers, see, one of the points they raise frequently is that India policies keep on changing drastically. Particularly, let's say there's a shortage of, say, uh, not shortage, let's say the prices of some agricultural commodity go up a bit. Indian government is very fast in imposing export uh, restrictions. We won't export because uh, the prices in India are going up. But the problem is that if you have entered into long-term agreements for, for exports, those long-term agreements do not carry any uh, credibility because the government can stop the supply at any time. So there is a conflict here. If you want to become a supplier to the world, you should be a reliable supplier. Not keep on changing your policies if there is an inflationary surge inside the country. These are some of the things that will have to be kept in mind. Any any more questions, please? Go ahead. Good evening, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, the economic growth is uh, impressive, sir. But uh, the point that is being raised is that uh, the private consumption grew at only 4.4%. Uh, and there is a disparity between uh, rural and urban areas. And even the uh, income growth rates in low-income segments have been very low. So this raises questions uh, over the sustainability of uh, growth, which is uh, right now being driven by CAPEX. So what can be done to increase that private consumption, which is a major portion of our GDP? Private consumption will go up as good quality jobs are created, for example. Now, where will the good quality jobs come from? They will not come from, Man from Manrega. Manrega is not good quality job. Manrega is a relief beggar. So good quality jobs will be created when we have better infrastructure, better logistics, more investments then come in into manufacturing. So all these policies that are there for manufacturing, etc., are promoting this type of approach. But results will obviously take time. Now, meanwhile, we need to put more focus on uh, medium and small enterprises, SMEs. That's one of the limitations of this year's budget. This year's budget, the interim budget, has not talked about SMEs in any significant way. Maybe in the main budget, they will again have some proposals for boosting SMEs. SMEs are quite significant in terms of providing employment, especially in rural India, smaller towns and cities and so on. So we do have you know, approaches there. Everything will not come together. Let me put it that way. We need to have we need to have steps for this also, undoubtedly. But the infrastructure, the capital expenditure, is in some ways the overarching story for this. Overarching, and then other things you have to supplement with that. Agriculture, undoubtedly, agriculture will also be important. 40% of the people are still directly dependent on agriculture. So you need to have, and of course, agriculture can also make significant contribution otherwise. But one point here that I'll make is states have to play a much bigger role also. A lot of the things that need to be done now have to be done at the state level. To expect the central government to throw in a lot of money and that will solve the problem in these areas, I think that will not work out. States have to have you know, take greater responsibility. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Right. Any anything else? Sir, Good evening. I have a question. Sure. Go ahead. Uh, sir, like you talked about rooftop solars, there was yeah. earlier also a subsidy on buying of uh, grid-connected rooftop solar. So, what is it that government no, has the, done differently the this time? The difference is that you see this is focused. Uh, well. I don't remember the exact details in terms of how it will be financed, but I think the subsidy component is much more and it's focused more on uh, 
middle class and lower income groups in okay. terms of you know there, there will be certain parameters will ensure that it will be basically middle class and lower income groups there for them this can make a significant difference in terms of their energy cost and this plus also a... the way they will be financing it will be different uh, this will 300 be uh, unit free 300 units free and will be financed through the rec this is the central government rural electrification corporation this will be doing the financing involving private technology players earlier the policies apparently were such that very few people took this up i think the targets that were achieved were of the order of 10 percent or so this time they are hopeful that with the restructured program this can be a much bigger thing in the next three years that's the idea put in more money but also have better organization again states again the importance will be what about the states it's a state state uh, power utilities that will have to provide this net metering, etc. And there are many states which are lagging behind. So they will have to be incentivized. The central government should provide some incentives for them also. Just telling them to do it will not be enough. I don't know what sort of incentives they might provide, but some incentives to bring the states on board. And states obviously should not take this line. And another unfortunate thing is the states often take a political line on this. West Bengal, for example, will often say, we won't do it because this is the Pradhan Mantri Yojana. We want a Mukhya Mantri Yojana, which means nothing. Nothing will happen in Bengal then. They'll make it very difficult. So the politics is also important. That's why I said the political economy is also important in these types of things. Right? Any last question? Sir, I had a question, sir. Yes. Uh, sir, uh, two brief ones, sir. One, sir, a, a stream of criticism has pointed to the rising interest payments that we are making, sir. I think it's a quarter of the total expenditure. Right. So what are the implications of that, sir? Where did we find the fiscal room to bring the fiscal deficit down to 5.1% with that uh, rise, with that share of interest payments? And second, sir, there's been a lot of talk uh, about the investment rate in the economy. 30% uh, it, it is right now, sir. So mm -hmm. does capital expenditure feed into that investment rate? And sir, what yes. are the ways in which what are the ways in which we could increase the investment rate uh, of the country, sir? Thank you, sir. Right. So your first question is concerned with the interest. The interest liability obviously depends on the past to loans that you have taken. You have to pay interest on them. If you slow down the rate at which you're borrowing, which means you're bringing down the fiscal deficit. Remember, fiscal deficit means that you still have to borrow, but you're slowing it down. If it is lower, considerably lower than the growth rate of the economy, then the resources that you're going to generate will be enough ultimately to pay for this. This is one idea. The other is that in the last couple of years, the interest rates have risen a lot. RBI policy, Monetary Policy Committee, now, the rising interest rate scenario is now reversing. We expect to have interest rates coming down. Now, when interest rates start coming down, then your bond yields come down. Your bonds, it becomes easier to borrow with less burden. So that is likely to happen in the coming three, four years. So overall, with good fiscal policy on one side and with decreasing interest rates, the interest burden will be less significant as compared to the growth that we are achieving. That is one. Your other question, I think, is concerned with investments and capital expenditure. See, there the problem is what we talked about here, that much of the capital expenditure and the investments have come from the government in recent times. Not only the government, the private sector is also doing it, but private sector has not been... Uh, you know, pulling its weight here for various reasons. Part of it is concerned with the over-exuberant investments that had taken place in, say, 2010 decades, leaving a lot of debt uh, burden on many companies. All that is now being gradually resolved. Gradually resolved. It's been a slow process, IBC, etc. But it is hoped that the private sector will be making bigger investments and plus we'll be attracting more investments from abroad 
the direct investments also as these supply chains are restructured. So we have you know, better ease of doing business, better infrastructure. Then we attract more investments from outside, plus boost investments in our own country. Well, hopefully, this takes care of you know, the stepping up the rate from say 30% to 35% to 38% and so on. But at the same time, consumption will also be important. We should not underemphasize consumption. One of the big problems for China has been overinvestment and low levels of consumption. So those who were talking about earlier about the consumption issues, I think that also has significance. I think Thank you. yes. Any any comment? No. I think we have covered most of the issues, almost all the issues that are of interest. You can look at summaries of this uh, report, the Indian Economy. A review. It talks about a lot of other things. I don't think they will come up much more in the interviews. They will be more important in future for the main exam and so on. But of course, by that time, you would also have the uh, regular economic survey. Right? So these are some of the things that you should keep in mind at the time of the interview. Uh, thanks. Best wishes for the interview. Right? Well, I had one question. Yes, right. This is the last question then. Also, also, it's regarding the performance of the PSUs. So you said that uh, greater autonomy being provided to the PSUs is one of the main reasons. So that's they, one of the factors. Yes. Yes, sir, sir, I, yes sir, I wanted to know the other reasons behind a uh, uh, very good performance of PSUs. Uh, there. It will depend now on different sectors. Let me just focus on banks for a moment, public sector banks. Public sector banks had very poor quality balance sheet earlier. You know, in terms of NPAs, accumulated NPAs, lot of unrecoverable loans and so on, for various reasons, partly political reasons because they were forced to lend and partly because of uh, poor quality of management supervision and so on. Now, last, decade, gradually these balance sheets have been cleaned up. Cleaned up means you start recovering some of those loans, writing off the others, selling them off. And you know various ways in which you get rid of them. And once the balance sheet is improved, the capital position improves, then they start lending again. Now, partly they benefit from the high interest rate scenario because what happens is the banks lend money at higher interest rates without increasing the interest rate payable on the deposits in the same ratio. That goes up slowly. So that also helps them, but that helps the private sector also. That's not just for the public sector banks. That applies to HDFC, ICICI also. Yet in many ways, the financials of these public sector banks are now considerably better than ICICI access and so on. Merger of these banks and restructuring, I think, has also had some impact in the banking sector. And banking sector is a big sector, keep that in mind, public sector banks. The merger, rationalization, banks are now bigger, a better position to take advantages of scale economies and so So these types of changes have, have helped the public sector to improve. Other sectors, there are other factors also. I'm not pointing on all these sectors here. But similar approach, other areas. So, so sir, can we say that uh, the better performance of PSUs is, is uh, largely attributed to PSBs or it is general across all the sectors? It's general. It's general. The railway, uh, the variety of PSUs in the railways, for example, variety of PSUs concerned with defense sector. Now, there again, policies have changed, focusing more on domestic defense production. So that benefits a lot of those defense sector PSUs. So these types of policies have helped to improve the performance of the PSUs. Right. Yes. Okay. Sir. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, I'll provide the slides, although you've seen them, but I'll provide the slides to Rajuji and you can get copies from there. Right. Thank you, sir. Right. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. All right.
Thanks.